Well, let me uh, welcome you to our service this morning and uh, welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're here in the building or watching uh, from home or even further afield. We do uh, welcome you and greet you uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, please don't uh, judge me uh, uh, by outward appearance. There is a poppy on the inside, even if I'm not wearing one. On the outside, some things just didn't happen this week, and I apologise for that. But uh, We are here to worship God. Let's uh, begin by uh, hearing his words. This is uh, Psalm 99, which reminds us, The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Well, uh, these words remind us who is really on the throne. So let's praise his great and awesome name, O God, beyond all praising. If you'd like to stand, please do so and let's sing God's praise together. Come before our God in prayer together. We come before you humbly, our God, aware of your greatness and majesty. Uh, you truly are the God who is king and is reigning. We're also aware that you're the one that sees all things and knows all things and plans all things. And you know us better than we know ourselves. Nothing is hidden from your sight. And so, Lord, as we reflect back on this past week, uh, you know how we have lived this week. And often uh, we haven't thought about you or uh, we've lived in without consulting you or seeking you or leaning into you as we could or should. And so we come pleading again that you might be merciful and forgiving to us. We thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ there is a great and uh, wonderful welcome. And so, Lord, we ask not only for forgiveness, but also we ask for help to remember and to reflect on all that uh, you have given us and done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Take us back to the very heart of the, the wonder of the gospel of our Saviour and uh, all that you have done to, to uh, make us your own and to change us and to forgive us. 
Lord, help us to remember that which is most important then. We do praise you for the Lord Jesus, our great and wonderful Saviour. And Lord, we marvel that you have loved us with such an incredible love. You have loved us to the very end. And so we pray that whatever life may be for us at the moment, uh, uh, hardships or toils or struggles or whatever may be coming this week, uh, Lord, we pray that as we gather this morning, we might truly be a people Uh, who want to worship and praise your great name, a people of praise. So help us today to do that. And we pray, speak to us and do us good as we look at your word together. Uh, May we be a people then that know our God better through having spent this time in this way. Hear our prayers and meet by your spirit amongst us, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, Peter reminds us uh, who we are. He says, you are a chosen people, this is 1 Peter 2, 9, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That is the great thing that God has done for us. That's what he has made us. Let's sing of that reality. I was once lost in darkness. It's the song, all I have is Christ. Let's again stand if we're able. Time for the children's talk now, and uh, Nathan is doing it for us this week. So, So good morning. Um, 
I'd like to thank whoever organised the Rotors for the Children's Talk for giving me a really easy part of 1 Peter's letter to share with the kids this morning. Um, so we've been going through the, the letter of 1 Peter and we've been trying to find a, um, a word or a theme from the passage that we can get hold of. And in this morning's passage, um, Peter's talking about two different ways that we can choose to live our lives. There's a way that is for ourselves and there's a way that's for God. Now, Peter, when he wrote his letter, and I'm not having a go at him because he's an apostle, but he's really just remembering what Jesus had taught him when he was following Jesus. And he's explaining it in a bit more detail for people who never actually met Jesus. And Jesus gave a really famous sermon. Does anyone know what it's called in the Bible? He gave quite a famous big talk. It was almost as long as one of Daniel's morning sermons. It was a sermon on the mount. Apparently it took all day. So no, it was a lot longer than a lot longer than Daniel's sermons. And in that sermon on the mount, Jesus taught some good ways to how he expects people who belong to the kingdom of heaven to live, but he also told some parables to explain it. And one of the parables was about two men who were building houses. And one of them found some good solid ground, some rock, and he dug a foundation into the rock and he built his house on that rock. And another guy was in more of a rush to get his house built. He wasn't so bothered about it being good. He just wanted it done quickly so that he would feel good about himself. And he found just any old bit of ground. In fact, Jesus said he built it on sand. I don't know if you've ever been to the seaside and tried to build a sandcastle. They don't last very long. In fact, sometimes they fall down as you're trying to build them. And this guy built his house on the sand. And Jesus in his parable said that the wind and the rain came and the guy whose house was built on the rock stayed up standing, but the guy whose house was built on sand just crumbled into the ground. And the other week when Daniel spoke to, to you guys, to the children, he said about, that in Peter's letter, he said that our lives were going to expect some suffering, some bad things to happen. And I think in that parable, the wind and the rain are the bad things that's going to happen. And Jesus says, you know, expect wind and rain. But if your life is built on Jesus' words as a foundation, then a roof tile might fall off or a window might blow in, but the house isn't going to fall down. So this morning, when we have the, the reading from Peter and we're hearing about the two ways to live, I want you to think about not just two ways to live, but two ways to build and to choose to build your life on the words that Jesus gave us. Because that's the only way we're going to live. It's the only way we're going to survive the wind and the rain and get through our life. And actually, when we, you know, we, if we're living to, to honour Jesus, then actually we don't just get a house built here. Jesus promises that there's a, you know, he's building a mansion for us in heaven. So, you know, that's what we're working towards. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's read that bit of uh, 1 Peter now, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, and uh, just the first uh, six verses we're looking at uh, this morning, and it runs like this. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living and they heap abuse on you. 
but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Well, we are uh, moving towards uh, 11 o'clock. We've got a few minutes to go. We've got a song we're going to be singing in a, in a moment. And um, uh, being Remembrance Sunday, we want to uh, reflect on the sacrifice that uh, others have made so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we do. And as we reflect then on, uh, uh, we don't just think back to, uh, obviously, Armistice Day has its history in the, the end of the world wars and, and connection with, with that. But we remember also the, the other conflicts that have gone on uh, uh, in, the, in the years since and the people that have uh, 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 maintained and fought and in many cases suffered or sacrificed uh, for, so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we do so today. And of course that's also been true not just in war but uh, through the pandemic of the past 18 months, many have uh, served and uh, put the interests of others ahead of themselves. And we want to be thankful for that and uh, thankful to God who has uh, been kind to us through all of that. Uh, it's really important to remember because so easily we forget, don't we? And so uh, the Bible is full of things that encourage us to reflect again and to remember and uh, remembering the sacrifice of others is um, something that's at the heart of the Bible because ultimately we remember that greatest sacrifice of all, that of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, uh, the wonderful way in which he uh, gave his life so that we might have eternal life, not just freedoms and blessings now, but uh, eternal life to look forward to. So uh, as we reflect on the sacrifice of others, we also reflect on the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are good gospel themes to be remembering and reflecting on this morning. So we've got a, a song now we're going to sing, a Remembrance uh, Hymn. Uh, we've played it a few times. I don't know whether we've ever sung it, uh, but uh, hopefully it will be e fairly easy for us to sing along to. And just encapsulates really what I've just been saying about remembering those, but also remembering uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to um, sing this now. Are you going to play the tune through or we're just going to go for it? Yeah, yeah. So they'll, pl they'll play. Yeah, we'll sing you the first verse. We'll sing you the first i 
Take your seats for a moment. All right, let me uh, pray, and then uh, as soon as I finish praying, I'll ask you to stand, and it will be time for the two minutes silence. Father in heaven, we come before you, and uh, it is good to reflect and to remember, and to remember those that have sacrificed their lives and uh, over this past century in the world wars and at other points too and we're so thankful our God for the freedoms the blessings the joys that we have now because uh, others were willing to make that sacrifice and Lord um, we realize that that is a, a mirror image it's a beautiful uh, picture of what you are about as the living God who gave your son to be our saviour. So we praise you in his name. Amen. Right, let's stand and we'll have two minutes silence. Father, may our quiet and our remembering be honourable in your sight. And our prayer is that we might be granted as a people, as a nation, 
stability and peace in your will for many years to come. And help us to use it for your honour and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're looking at uh, 1 Peter 4, 1 to 6, which we read a little bit earlier. Let's ask God to help us to understand it. Lord, we pray you would uh, open our eyes and our hearts to hear your word this morning. Help us to be receptive to what you are saying. Help us to grasp not just the exhortation, but also the, the reasonings behind it. And Lord, we pray that truly our lives would be beautifully different by your word ministering to our hearts and lives. We pray for the Bible explorers too. You'd bless them as they meet together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage seems to upset people. Uh, 29 years ago, I was asked to lead a Bible study in the halls of residence that I'd recently arrived at as a student. And the passage that was assigned, we were going through 1 Peter, was this one. And uh, uh, we had a feisty discussion. Eight years ago, uh, I preached on this passage here in Dewsbury. We weren't meeting in this building then. Uh, but I remember it got a similar uh, reaction. Come on, you can't be serious. The issue is what Peter says in verses 3 and 4. You have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. Because sadly... That is often a picture of how professing Christians are living their lives. And there is no difference between them and the world around us. Whereas Peter anticipates there will be, and they will find it strange that we don't join them in the living the way they do. And yet this passage is clearly a call not to live like that. Look at verse 2. As a result, do not live the rest of their earthly lives, or we could put it directly, your earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And the point then of this passage is to say that things are different now. Something has changed. And a Christian then, as we read from earlier in 1 Peter, is a person who belongs to God. And that means then their life will be lived for God and not for sin. And that will make a radical difference to what you do with your time and energy and priorities. Peter is reinforcing, uh, drawing to a conclusion, the section that he began back in chapter 2, verse 11, where he said, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, that is, away from your home in heaven, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he fits us. He said, you won't fit in. You will be marginalised. You will suffer. But there's a better way. And that better way is following the Lord Jesus Christ. So chapter 4 verse 1 begins, Arm yourself also with the same attitude since Christ suffered in his body. And so we need to live lives that please him and are focused on the glory which is to come. And so be ready for that day. So this is a call to be beautifully different. Whatever the cost, as we await the call home to be with Jesus. We're going to think about three things then as we uh, look at this passage this morning. The the lifestyle collision, the mindset change, and the judgment coming. So are you ready to hear? And uh, I can't guarantee that this won't upset you or offend you, but I hope it's God's word that's doing that, rather than anything that I particularly am saying. And maybe if that's the case and it's pressing against our conscience, we need to hear it and respond accordingly and and make those changes in the light of what God says. So the lifestyle collision, the mindset change, the
the judgment coming. So first of all then, the lifestyle collision. What practical ways are our lives to be different? They, they find it strange that we don't join in. Well, what in what things? So Peter has this list in verse 3 where he describes, he says, you spent enough time doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. Let me just run through the words and tell you what they mean, just in case you, you haven't grasped the picture that uh, Peter is painting. Debauchery is uh, excessive indulgence in sex and alcohol and drugs and of course that then is connected with all kinds of of evil that becomes intertwined with it. Lust is a strong sexual desire that is controlling and driving you. Drunkenness is obviously drinking too much alcohol so that you are losing uh, self-control and are out of it. The Bible doesn't forbid us from drinking but drunkenness is clearly uh, not appropriate for those that follow Christ. Orgies, this is banquets and feasts which are given over to wild immorality, carousing, noisy drinking parties. And then the list ends with detestable idolatry. That seems a bit out of place, doesn't it? You know, when you think of all, the, all these other words, you can sort of imagine the, the the wild parties with all of these things going on, but are those things you don't then generally see people buying down to little statues. So why does he say detestable idolatry? Well, because actually an idol is anything that is worshipped instead of God. So it may not be a physical thing. And actually the idol which is behind all of these things is pleasure comfort and having fun. If it feels good, do it. And those things then have become the thing that is driving the, the desires behind all these other things. And so people are saying, it doesn't matter what you do, as long as you are having fun, if it feels good, do it. And he sums it up then in verse 4 with reckless, wild living. And Peter has to say, you spent enough time living like this, no more. Now all of us need to hear the challenge of God's word. Maybe there are some uh, here or watching or listening to this who this is the lifestyle that you have, that you are living like this. Maybe on the quiet, maybe it's a dominant part of your life. And if that's the case, Peter says, stop. Maybe some of you are doing this in a virtual world. The games you play fit this description perfectly. And you may not be, oh, I'm not doing it in person, yeah, but in the way you're embracing your mind and acting it out in the games you play, it fits a ball with following Christ. Maybe it's not the games you play. Maybe it's the things you watch. Maybe you're being entertained by this lifestyle. And it's, you're embracing it in that way. Now, I'm not giving you a list of what you can or can't watch. I'm just saying you need to think. Each of us needs to think and be challenged by God's word and say, have we slipped into, into this in a subtler way uh, than perhaps we have first thought? You see, the reality is that all of us are influenced by this idol of pleasure because it's so dominant, it's ingrained into our society that we are a part of. That's what drives so much of what people are about. We're coming up to the, the big time of year, aren't we, for consuming and enjoying Christmas, New Year, the midwinter festival. And for many, that's what it's all about. How much can I consume? How much can I enjoy? What is going to feed those things the most? Now, let's be clear, in case you've misunderstood. God is not against us having fun. 
God is not against us enjoying times with friends. God is not against us having things. They are all good gifts from him. But he is against those things having us. That's the difference, where it's controlling you, where it's driving you, which is why he talks about evil human desires back in verse 2. He's talking about something that has captivated and has become the driving force in your life. And we need to remember then that uh, the world around us is dominated by this way of thinking. That's where the collision comes from. That's why they're surprised when you don't join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. The world cannot understand because they think this world is all that there is. We just have between when we're born and when we die and so we need to make the most of this life and we need to get as much consuming and enjoying in as possible. And they cannot understand when why we don't think the same way. It's like a pool you know, a group of people at a swimming pool and some have jumped in and are starting to have great fun and others are a bit hesitant round the edge and the people in the pool are saying, come on, come on, jump in, come on, we can all have fun. And, and that's the, the, the pressure that we feel, the, the world around us, our friends, people that we spend time with, members of our family, this is their philosophy, this is what's driving them. It may not be to the excessive extent of the way the picture that Peter has painted, but the underlying drive is the same. And they're saying, come join us. And remember the battle for the Christian is at the heart level. Because now there is a new desire at work in the Christian. We want to live for the will of God. But the old desires have, are still there. They may have been dethroned, but there's a kind of tug of war going on in our, in our lives. This is where the peer pressure then comes from. And this is where we may get hassle and abuse and ostracised in one way or another because we don't join in to the same extent in which they do. Come on, let your hair down, just have fun. Come on, one more drink won't harm. Come on, don't be a stooge, you know, all those kind of things. And we feel the pressure because we want to conform, but we also want to do what pleases God. And so this is then the, the lifestyle collision that we face as Christians in terms of how we live. Not always easy to navigate, but we are being called here to be beautifully different. Living for the will of God. Now, that may not feel particularly beautiful in the, in the world's eyes, but this has been beautifully different in the eyes of God, and that's what ultimately has to matter. I think if we're not feeling this at all, then maybe we've, we've slipped too far. Because this will be the experience of when you're seeking to follow Christ, you will feel this lifestyle collision. Let's secondly talk about the mindset change. Because uh, we need help if we're going to navigate this. And the Bible never just gives us commands. It always leads us to, to the power, the enabling, the, the reality, the truths that are going to to shape us in order to enable us to uh, be able to withstand that uh, collision and to be able to make good and healthy choices. So it's vital we grasp the logic of what Peter says in verses 1 and 2. He says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because whoever suffers in the body has finished with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their lives, earthly lives for evil to human desires, but rather for the will of God. So there's the, 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 the logic, the, the gospel mindset that needs to be embraced that leads to a different way of living. So let's try and go through the, 
the steps to see how Peter's pressing this, this truth that things are different now upon us. So Christ suffered in his body. This is where he starts. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body. And he's taking us back to things that he's been talking about in chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. And in chapter 2, verses 21 to 25. I'm not going to read them all, but let me just quote to you 3.18 and 2.21. So 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. 2.21 says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And now Peter's picking up those ideas and he's saying, think about, remember how Christ suffered in his body. You see, for Jesus, there was something more important than his own immediate pleasure. He was committed to doing the will of his father. And you see that same battle in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prays that, uh, uh, that the cup, he realises the, the enormity of the suffering and the challenge and the difficulty that faces him in going to the cross. And he asks it to be taken away. But he then says, but not my will, but your will. And even though it meant death on the cross then, he was willing to take the insults and the abuse and the suffering and the, the being made a penalty for sin. Even though he had no sin of his own, the righteous dying for the unrighteous. And he did this to, to save us so that we could be forgiven. So Peter's saying, think about the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has given you hope, who has given you forgiveness. And let's follow in his footsteps. The next step in his logic is to say, think like Christ. So therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. So he's saying, follow the same mindset, the same attitude that Christ had that took him on that journey to the cross where he was willing to give his life, where he was willing to die, where he puts what God wants and the great plan of salvation and the benefits and blessings that others will get ahead of his own. You could call it God pressure rather than peer pressure. So Peter says, think like Christ. Arm yourself with the same attitude and mindset that Christ had. The next bit of step is we have finished with sin. Because whoever suffers in the body has finished with sin. Now, you can read that, and the first way we read that, and we think, oh, that means I never sin again. No, that's not what he is saying. He's not saying that uh, we no longer sin, but he's talking about the, a break of ownership. We are no longer under the master of sin. We're no longer being controlled by sin because that has been broken by being united to the Lord Jesus Christ, by what he has done to pay for our sins. We are now under his lordship. Romans 6 put it, we're dead to sin. Sin has a power and authority in your life has gone. We're finished with sin as a way of living, as a ruler, as a king, as a, as a master. We've finished with him. We've got a new one, Jesus. Which leads to a new way of living. Verse 2, as a result, because Christ has suffered, and you are following him, and you finish with sin, as a result, don't live the rest of your earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. So out of this comes a new direction, a new orientation that comes from this change in relationship. And before, he says, the focus was evil human desires, literally human passions, 
that could be good things that have become the things that are now ruling and controlling our lives and they're often good things like money or family or home or fun or friends but they start to take over and they start to rule us and drive our choices and he says don't let those things anymore because that you've finished with sin and you're following Christ but rather the will of God now becomes the focus what pleases him it's very interesting this little detail as to what that looks like obviously he's told us some things back let me give you a couple of quotes in, from the chapters we've looked at in 2 and 3 2 16 says live as free people do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil live as God's slaves show proper respect to everyone love the family of believers fear God honor the emperor uh, 3 8 and 9 says finally all of you be like-minded be sympathetic love one another be compassionate and humble do not repay evil for evil or insult with insult on the contrary repay evil with blessing there's a sense of what the will of God is it's those things now the key thing in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4 is think differently the mindset change. Arm yourselves, he says, with the same attitude. It's very similar to the logic of Romans. Uh, Romans is that great exposition of the gospel that Paul gives. And for six chapters, he doesn't tell us to do anything. He's describing how we're full of sin, and all that God has done in coming in the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, after 148 verses, he tells us to do something. In Romans 6, 11, he says, count yourselves dead to sin. So the first exhortation in that massive book of Romans is change the way you think. Realise that something is now true of you. And Peter's doing exactly the same. Arm yourselves with the same attitude he's saying realize that something has changed because of what the Lord Jesus has done you have now finished with sin so stop living in it this is the change that happens when you become a Christian when you are converted when the the old master of sin is dethroned from your life and you're given a, a new better master in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are set free to be beautifully different the story is told of a great eagle that for years and years was tethered to a post and then a new owner set the eagle free and cut the tie but the eagle just kept living on the post. And so often we're like that. We have been set free from the master of sin by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are free now to live differently for the will of God. We don't have to spend our times serving the, the, the master of sin and of pleasure and of selfishness, but we still sit on the old post. Remember, pleasure didn't die for your sins. It's a God that promises much but never delivers. But Jesus is the God who came to be a man and did die for our sins and promises and gives much. He gives us new life. The mindset change. Arm yourself with the same attitude think differently understand the change that has happened because you've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and that then leads to this new lifestyle okay thirdly the judgment coming this passage is a bit like a hamburger you didn't realize that but I'm telling you now that it is and uh, uh, in the middle you've got uh, the lovely slither of uh, premium beef that is telling you to stop living as you formerly were and to live differently and then either side are the 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 reasons why so we've looked at the 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 bottom of the bread bun that the meat is sitting on 
which is telling us because of what Christ has done, you are to live differently. But now we're looking at the, the top piece of bread that goes on another reason as to why we are to, to live differently. The first one looked back at the death and resurrection of Jesus and said, in the light of that and the change that that has brought about in your life, live differently. The second, the top piece of bread, looks forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he tells us the judgment is coming. Verse 5. But they will give, have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. He's saying that this is the other reality. They're living, you see, as though this life is all that there is. There is just those sandwiched in between birth and death and so they want to make the most of everything and just live for now and the, and Peter's saying but that's not the reality the reality is after death is judgment and every single one of us is going to stand before God and have to give an explanation as to how we've lived and that's not just true for us but it's true for them too whether they acknowledge it or not those who are giving us hassle those are saying, come on, come on, just live for now, just live for today. He says, but they will have to give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. And that is to be, why is he telling us that? Well, it's to be a source of comfort to us. Justice will be done. They will have to stand before King Jesus. And they may think, ah, oh, we've got it all sorted and we know what life is all about. And, and Peter's saying, yeah, but just remember, that's not the reality. And God cares for his children and he takes note when we're laughed and mocked and made to suffer. And God will have the last word. That's one of the points he was making back in that tricky passage in 3.18 to 22. That uh, after Jesus had died and was made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. They mocked and laughed at Noah. But they had a too narrowed focus on what life was about. And in the end, when the whole picture was seen, they were seen to have made a mistake. And actually, Christ has died and risen and been victorious. God will have the last word. There's a day of judgment coming. And Christians will be saved. Verse 6 says, For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. This is, again, one of these verses in Peter that's a little bit tricky. But uh, I think the easiest and most straightforward way to understand it is he is talking about people who have died for their faith, where the abuse and the suffering and the hassle they've got has become so much that they've, they've actually been put to death. So if you think about that, that's who he's talking about. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, who've had to suffer the ultimate cost of following Christ, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body. See, they were laughed at and mocked and they were killed, but according to God in regard to the spirit. They may have been judged by the world and put to death like Jesus, but because of the gospel, they live. And they now live in the spirit before God. But of course, that's not just the hope of those that have died and died for following Christ. That's the hope of every Christian. Eternal life with God. And so Peter's trying to put our lives now into a context of eternity. And he's saying that life now might be hard and painful and we might find ourselves constantly at odds with the world around us but at the future is glorious this life is not all that there is there are better days to come 
lots of foods that we buy have a best before date, don't they? And you know that once you get to that date, you, you take it into your own risk if you continue to eat it, because it may well have gone off. We don't have a best before date. We have a best after date. We're looking forward to the day when Christ will return. When we'll be made like him. And we will have all eternity in this new heavens and new earth to enjoy with him. And Peter say, as you think about that and you think about life now in the light of the judgment that's coming and the glories of eternal life which will follow, he's saying, let that spur you to be beautifully different now. To live for God, recognising this life is just for a moment in comparison with eternity and therefore it doesn't matter so much if life is hard or you suffer. He's not minimising that in any way. He's just putting it into a bigger context. He's saying, be willing to give up reckless and wild living now because of all that is to come. Do you ever suffer from FOMO? The fear of missing out. That's what FOMO stands for. So I've still got some connections with a younger generation. And, um, uh, you know, you, 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 you oh, I want to be here and I want to be there. And, you know, sometimes I can't commit to something because to see you because there might be something better and I don't want to miss out. And in a sense, that's the pressure, isn't it, that we can feel the world is saying, come and enjoy this great party, this great thing. doesn't matter if you sin a little bit. Come on, you, you don't want to miss out. And we have to stop and say, oh, but I'm not missing out. In the grand scheme of things, I've been included into the most amazing thing of all. I belong to God. I've been given eternal life. I have knowledge of him. I have heaven to look forward to. And life may be difficult now, I may be treading a lonely path, there may be things that I choose not to do. I may be abused, I may be ostracised, I may be lonely, it may be difficult, but in the end I lose nothing because I have him. Let's be beautifully different. So Peter says in this passage, things are different now. He's saying, live differently, beautifully differently. You've got new priorities and a new lifestyle. There'll be things that you used to do that you do not do any longer. And the reason is, these two reasons, one, looking back because of what Christ has done in the way he died for you and paid for your sin and dethroned sin from your life and became your Lord and Master. And the second is because of the hope that you have in the future. So may our lives truly reflect the difference that knowing Jesus makes. And may we be those that really do live for the will of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, this passage is challenging to us because if we're honest, often our lives do look remarkably like those around us. Maybe we don't outwardly engage in many of the activities that others do, but in our hearts we can so easily be in the same place. Chasing after pleasure and comfort and enjoyment in this life, as though this is all that there is. And so easily those desires can take over. Forgive us, Lord, if that's the case. And Lord, bring us back to the reality of what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, how we've finished with sin and how Christ made choices and help us to make those same choices to let things go that we might do the will of God and please you. And help us to remember when that is hard and difficult that there is a judgment coming and there is a glorious future for those of us who belong to Christ. Lord, we need your help. We need your enabling. And so we pray by your mercy and by your spirit 
transform us to be beautifully different people. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, sing. We're going to sing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, which uh, talks about being changed from glory into glory. Uh, That's what we long for as the Spirit of God takes his word and works in our hearts and lives. So let's uh, sing God's praise together. take your seats. If you're watching this as a a recording on catch up, that's the end. Thank you so much for watching and may God bless you.